and we got slides up. Ooh, and I got clicky. Okay, so I'm Chris Corrier. Um, the best way to explain me is socio-technological mathematician at large. So uh, I've got a background in mathematics, and I do a lot of work design and system design, game theory kind of stuff. Uh, so this almost serves as a disclaimer, right? Uh, I do hang out with the security crowd a lot, but I'm <coughs> primarily in the DevOps community. Uh, but uh, that's a very high level view, and the mathematics lets me branch out into other stuff pretty easily. Um, so I'm gonna we're gonna get into some neat stuff today. Um, I'm also an organizer for DevOps Days Atlanta. Uh, I'm an organizer for DevOps ATL. Uh, I help out with the inclusive collaboration movement that started out of England. They're actually trying to raise awareness around neurodiversity in tech. So I, I'm not autistic. I don't have Asperger's. I am a complex variety, so I'm not. I'm neurodivergent. I'm not neurotypical. So eating lunch with some very nice people, and one, someone said, "You're definitely not normal." It's like. I agree with that. Uh, it's also Map Camp, um, which is organized by Simon Wardley. He invented Wardley mapping, but I helped him with that. That's also out of London. Uh, I think we're trying to do one in Atlanta next year. But come join like the DevOps Atlanta community. Like we love security people. Y'all are more than welcome to come hang out with us. Uh, key takeaways here. So uh, we're going to augment humans with tech instead of replacing them. It's a key focus of this talk. Uh, we're going to spend time together, communicate, and build trust. So we're socio-technical systems. Just looking at the tech part of the system you're working on, you're missing the big human factor social piece, right? Systems are boring without people in them. They don't do anything. So we, we've got to remember we've got real human beings in the system. Um, and on that note, we need to work in diverse teams with mutual goals. Uh, a lot of people here on the job hunt keep telling me they're looking for a security position. Like, you know, so much about security, you've got all these certifications, uh, you're running into these ridiculous uh, job openings, they want 15 years of experience, go code back in Java and be security's best friend on that team. They will love you, okay? Um, but we need that more diversity, more center of practice diffused through an organization, uh, and less siloed activity, right? So security can't just be in security anymore. You gotta permeate the rest of the world. Uh, minimize your threat surface. So I'm not a security expert. I'm not even going to try to argue that. And we, you, we could get into some dunning Kruger stuff. Uh, but this this is always true. This is always advice I follow. If we're minimizing threat surface, we're probably going to have a better day. So um, on that note, I do want feedback on all this. If any of it's wrong, your security experts, please come tell me. This is what we're doing in the DevOps community right now around security. So I'm going to drop a lot of information. I'm going to move really quick. Some of this is like two or three days worth of workshops we could do instead. I'm going to cover this in like 40 minutes. So we're going to cover some maps. I'm going to get into security and open source software ecosystems. And then we're going to get into some call to action kind of stuff. So some maps. Uh, so I do need to do the intro to DevOps. So the first way is system syncing. We want the system level view. Uh, the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim and Kevin Bear and some other folks is a good book to reference for that. Um, the second way is uh, amplifying feedback loops. So we want information back to people who can make changes to correct it. We don't just want to document this stuff and store it. We want an actionable feedback, right? Um, continuous delivery by Jess Humble. Um, and Dave Farley, that's another big publication. They talk a lot about automating feedback loops. Um, and the third way is a culture of continual experimentation and learning. And that's the understanding this connection between failure and learning, that if we have fail-safe organizations where it's okay to make a mistake and learn, you're gonna be more adaptive and live longer than a rigid org where you're blame-centered and it's not okay to make mistakes, because then you can't learn. So this is sort of definition of DevOps. There's some Pink Floyd playing somewhere in the building. Um, we've got inclusion, complexity, and empathy, culture, automation, lean learning. I, a lot of this comes out of Six Sigma community. Uh, measurement and sharing. Right. This is a broader definition of DevOps from a, a list perspective. Uh, but this is a general introduction. I almost didn't go over these slides today because I talk about this a lot, but someone said this might be new to y'all. So quick introduction to DevOps. Uh, and Andre 3000, just to remind you what's cooler than being cool, science columns. So that's that acronym. Easy to remember, easy DevOps 101 stuff. If someone wants to pull you into the weeds with it, 
culture sharing, automation, inclusion, complexity, and empathy. So, we put the SAC and DevSecOps to explicitly invite all to the party. Um, it's, it's understood, it's implied in the general term, but if security people are thinking, well, DevOps isn't for me, we're actually, that whole agility thing and being able to pivot quicker, um, as an adaptive organization, we're more secure if we can change quicker, right? Uh, so we want all, your help with this. We're not experts on it, but we're doing the best we can with the tools we have. Um, the dilemma is the fact that the invitation isn't implied. So this is everybody, right? Everybody's in the club. Um, who's familiar with Nash Equilibrium's Prisoner's Dilemma? Got a few folks. So this is ultimately a bad game board. Um, the problem we want to run into a lot is it's who's going to go to jail. Um, the only way you can not go to jail in this game board uh, with this payout matrix is if you throw your partner under the bus. So this is right for, it's a stage for competition, right? It's a terrible game board. This is a little bit better game board. This is a stag hunt. So we would get two points if we cooperate and kill a stag. Um, we each get one point if we kill a rabbit. But in this uh, exclusive voice situation where one of us defects to hunt rabbits and the other one's trying to hunt a stag by himself, uh, we, uh, somebody ends up going hungry. So on, on the flip side of this, you have Nash equilibria and game states that are naturally poised towards competition, right? So this is an environmental problem more than the game itself, right? Uh, it's a product of the environment. Um, and we're learning that org design and changing culture within an org is a big part of getting these safe game states. Uh, this isn't deductive or inductive, but adductive logic, which means it's not what top level zooming in. Um, we're not trying to deduce what's true, and we're not trying to induce it from a bottom up, like in a recursive step. This is more gravitational, about what's probably going to happen just if we let the chips fall, right or wrong, what's likely. Uh, so this is a, a trinary Nash equilibria. This is a board I came up with. Um, and if you can see here, we've got commensalism as uh, holds up the most spots on this board. So this is enumerative combinatorics by expanding our board options and our choices, where we can just be commensal and share a table together. Um, in respect that, we need developers and security in the building at the same time. Um, we're going to get into competition about some things. Um, we're going to step on each other sometimes, which is what a mentalistic behavior is. Uh, sometimes people will prey upon each other if someone's trying to help put them in a position to take advantage of it. DevOps very much wants this high trust symbiotic behavior, uh, but that exposes us to some risk, as y'all know. Um, and sometimes we're going to get pulled into this competition about do we need access rights and is that allowed within the org. Um, but if we can always come back and recenter on this commensal state, nobody goes to jail. Fair enough. So, yeah, DevSecOps. This is uh, Pete Cheslock, right? Uh, the automation does a lot of good stuff, but sometimes it leaves messes for. Uh, Security cleanup, right? So these rainbow shooting unicorns that you all day long. Does anybody feel like they're dealing with this in their work? Does anybody like those DevOps guys? We've got a couple hands. All right. So this isn't what we want. This is this is competition, not cooperation, right? It definitely isn't commensal. Um, and this is because we're dealing in a complex domain. So uh, this is a Kinevin ontological sense making framework by Dave Snowden. That's a mouthful, right? Um, we like Especially in Western culture, we like these linear best practices. Um, uh, don't put your post-it note on a keyboard, right? Because we're going to find it and get into your system. But then we get into this good practice where it's this complicated domain where you've got experts say, yes, and we're going to change the passwords every 60 days, and they have to be unique, and you can't rotate them. And then we drift over into this complex domain where we've zoomed out a little bit more and have people into the equation. It's like, well, if I'm changing my password all the time, then I forget it. And all of a sudden, I'm writing it on a post-it note again. And that's how we dive into this chaotic state, uh, where things are, that's everything's fine dog, right? The building is effectively on fire, um, either because uh, we're having trouble logging into our system because we're maintaining compliance, or we've fallen it over this way. We've oversimplified it, and we're still breaking that, uh, that simple best practice rule of not writing our password down somewhere. So this is where the people come into it. Um, socio-technical system. Uh, we like this linear space. We like to refer to experts. Um, but it's definitely emergent practice based off of more factors than you're going to be able to calculate in. Um, so this is what we call fat tail distributions, just how we compute things with calculus and central limit theorem out the door. 
Um, we're finding out that the dependency chain in most socio-technical systems leads to fat tail distributions, which means uh, your mean doesn't mean as much anymore. You've got wider variance in the tails, and uh, those black swan events are more likely to occur as the dependencies line up. So again, it's environmental. If the dependencies are there for something to catch on fire, it's probably going to catch on fire. Um, so this makes uh, Newton cry because calculus is sort of like shrunk all of a sudden and isn't as impactful, and statistics doesn't mean as much anymore because binomial distributions are uh, rarer than we would like them to be. We don't see them as often as we should. So uh, Thomas Thwaites and his toaster project. Does anybody know about this? Uh, this guy tried to invent a toaster, but was like, this is a simple thing. I can buy one for like less than 20 bucks. Obviously, I can just reverse engineer this thing, take it apart and reverse engineer and build a toaster. That's what he ended up with. He's got a book on it. Um, and he ended up, it, he plugged it in for about five seconds and it fizzled and kind of toasted some toast before it smoked out. Uh, but he was like trying to smell his own iron and forge his own plastic. He was like getting like bark off of rubber trees, like nothing off the shelf. He was trying to build everything in house and he just couldn't do it. It's not possible. We take it for granted, the supply chain in front of us, right? Uh, especially in an open source community. Nobody's like forging, like forging copper for their x86 bus. Um, you didn't build your processor, you didn't write your kernel. This notion that I'm going to write all the Java myself and it's going to be awesome and I don't just want to download the thing off the shelf and use that, um, that's had a lot of very well qualified people coding on it for a very long time, is ridiculous. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about Thomas and Wardley maps and value chains. So with a value chain, traditional value chain, uh, and this one's for a technical need, customer need, which is highly visible, which could be I want to make toast. Um, you get your requirements for that, and then you source your dependencies, right? So if I'm building something, I get my requirements, I'm going to write some source code. I'm definitely going to lean, lean on some open source components or at least some third party libraries from somewhere. Um, and I really like things as a service. If I can provide, pay a provider to just provide that access and that functionality to me, um, and I can afford it, I'll take that option, right? Let them specialize. Uh, here's a picture of me, Simon, and Kaimar at Lean Agile Scotland last year. We did this thing with MapCamp in this event in Scotland where we were flying back and forth between London and Edinburgh all week. Uh, but what Simon did uh, with, with the Wardley map is he broke this out into these uh, domains, right? So Genesis is this idea exists in the world, but we know, don't know how to build it yet. So autonomous vehicles are in Genesis right now. Um, they're not in that complex domain where it's not quite emergent. It's crossed that threshold into we're trying to manifest this thing. We just haven't done it yet. Um, once you move out of Genesis, you get into custom built where certain organizations will be able to build this thing in house. They've seen one exist in the wild, but it's not a product you can buy off the market, like off the street yet. Um, after we get done with custom built, this diffuses further into products. You can just buy it off a rack somewhere. There's also a rental functionality that comes with that. And once we get out of product, it comes into commodity, uh, where I might be able to summon an autonomous vehicle from the curb with my phone with like Lyft or Uber or something like that. And uh, this is the gameplay Amazon made. They took compute and turned it into a commodity function. Uh, it's a utility. You can spin up compute like you can turn on a tap for water or you can flick a switch for electricity, right? Um, which means I don't have to build data centers anymore. I don't have to deal with that complexity in-house. I can outsource it. So, um, here's a wordly map for developer feedback. Um, this is some of what we're doing uh, within automation within DevSecOps. This automated feedback is this commodity thing where we really want that flying out like it's off of a tap. Um, we like IDE plugins that go straight to a product level and get that feedback to a developer as far left in the process as we can so it's in their face and in a position where they can take corrective action before they commit their code. Um, once they've done a pull request and this automated build has run and they, they've got all green lights from the automated system, it gets rid of all the dumb noise like hard-coded passwords for instance um, that we don't want to waste a security professional's time with and we can get to a more articulate peer review, that's going to be custom built because we really want that to be a face-to-face -face conversation with a real person or maybe even a group of people. Um, uh, this ties into source control. Um, again, the development environment itself is back in product domain. Your requirements should be custom built in-house. 
Um, and this should align with a very visible development need that's coming from a business, a customer. It might be a business customer, it might be an external customer, right? Um, where we are injecting some of this feedback, uh, I don't like Crucible that much. They were using it at the shop. This, this is real work. This was a map I was using internally a couple jobs ago. They're using Crucible for code review, but they moved to Git pull. Um, where if you file a pull request, before that gets merged in, we run a number of automated checks, and if it doesn't pass, you, you get a notification. You've got red and yellow lights, and you need to clean your code up and make another commit before we're even really going to consider merging it into trunk, right? Uh, Sonar cube we use for static analysis, along with Nexus Lifecycle. Um, Nexus Lifecycle does third-party dependency management. Um, there is an OWASP plugin that does it as well. It's not as strong of a tool, but the OWASP one is free. Um, and over here in this automated feedback, you've got build pipelines, which could be Jenkins or Circle CI or Go CD. There's a number of them. Um, unit testing, uh, Sonar cube scans for OWASP top 10. Um, we've got deploy and integration tests, uh, things like threat stack, uh, HP Fortify on demand is still popular. It's not my favorite tool, but it's better than nothing. They're not scanning. Um, and I also like a Zeta attack proxy. So we, we spin that up automatically during an automated build. It's not a full authentic pin test. It does not replace that, but it does get us some quick feedback. Even just the spider off of that, to hammer our URL and tell us what code's not getting executed, what links are showing up dead. Um, it's still a lot of good feedback and a broader understanding of uh, risk profile, right? Uh, and I have talked to a lot of security folks that prefer Burp Suite, but again, Burp Suite's not a free tool. Um, it does cost a little bit of money, and it's, it doesn't lend itself to the automation quite the same way that does right now. If you know more about that and I'm wrong, please come tell me after my talk. So, Security and open source e ecosystems. What does this mean for us, right? Don't build it in-house. Just go get it from somebody else. What could possibly go wrong? So back to this again. Um, so uh, we ended up having a big break with uh, back-end JavaScript because all of a sudden front-end code and back-end code ended up looking very similar. It allowed a developer to ramp up and learn how to code full stack a lot quicker. Um, and we, we actually had a shout out to this, the NPM uh, left pad issue that, that happened, what's the date that I have on there? It was last year, Three I think. Years ago. Yeah, a couple years ago? Yeah, it's 16. It says it right there. Okay. 24, 16. So um, this wasn't a vulnerability, right? Uh, what this was is, this was, left pad was just a low level dependency within the NPM tool chain, right? So if you were running a, a repository, which could be Artifactory or uh, Sonatype Nexus is another one. And you had left pad cached on-prem, you had it on your local network, you were fine that day. But if you were resolving everything from NPM in real time and depending on that external dependency, this broke production. You could not build and ship code if you were running uh, anything that had, had this dependency in its chain, right? So this isn't a, a security vulnerability, but it's still a vulnerability and some exposed risk that could have been mitigated by running a, an on-site repo, right? Um, and this dependency thing chain, dependency chain plays out where, uh, yeah, it shakes the open source trust model, right? So uh, 39 malicious packages in NPM undetected for two weeks. Uh, and I, I feel personally that the JavaScript community left a lot of lessons learned at the door that Java had been through a lot of this stuff and knew how dependency management worked better and had a stronger ecosystem, but it's just like, that's too complicated. We want to code in JS. A lot of that went, went out the window with it, right? So uh, relearning a lot of lessons in this space. 52% uh, of all JavaScript NPM packages could have been hacked uh, via weak credentials. So this was just where they were not changing login passwords around dependency management with the NPM repo. Um, so malicious code would have been scanned and discovered, uh, these, these issues before the attack could have gained publish access to almost 70,000 NPM packages, which is 13% of the entire JavaScript NPM ecosystem. That's a lot, right? That's the odds of you pulling down something hot have gone up a lot. Uh, but if you pull in uh, the dependencies along with that, it jumps to 52% malicious code. 
So maybe it's not the thing you're using, but if the thing you're using depends on something that I've got an exploit in and you pull that in, um, are you scanning CVs for all the dependencies of your dependencies, right? This tertiary dependency situation. 52% um, of the NPM ecosystem, that's, that's not all of it, but from a security perspective, that's enough where I'm kind of like, okay, that's pushing everything at this point. Uh, and this one was just a couple days ago. Um, and this might be a rehash because it's the same author, uh, but this just happened again where they found a deprecated package that wasn't in use anymore. Um, and it kind of floated away and someone just rolled out uh, a, a vulnerability and an exploit in this package. Um, and sure enough, there were enough people using deprecated packages that it pulled it in. They didn't even need this. It was just bad housekeeping. It was left in the dependency chain. They hadn't upgraded and it's, it was an opportunity to sneak in. Somebody realized it and went and published the threat thinking they're going to pull this. They don't know what they're pulling down from NPM. So what can you do? Um, Socio-technical systems depend on nine fundamental human needs. This is Manfred Meg's Neef. Um, I'm not going to read out all nine of these, uh, but they do have four existential categories for each of the nine needs. This turns into like a 36 cell matrix. So here's just the first row that you need subsistence. Uh, this means being physically and mentally healthy, which means having food, shelter, and employment, which means eating, drinking, sleeping, working, and interacting in your home and place of employment. So uh, all these break out that way, right? Um, so participation, affection, and this is a flatter ontology. It's not the hierarchy we're used to seeing. Um, and it's, it's a way that this, this is getting into work-life balance a little bit, right? Uh, you can't tell me someone who's very rich but is very alone is going to be happier than someone who's poor but has an str extremely strong community relationship, right? So uh, this is ERG theory, uh, uh, which again, this is a flatter ontology. Um, existence needs play into relatedness needs, play into growth needs, but we move back and forth this from a flatter, higher, it's less hierarchy, it's a flatter ontology. Uh, these two things together have replaced Maslow's hierarchy needs, right? Um, uh, and the reason this is important is this is getting back to the human-centered design aspect. Um, um, what does this have to do with coal mining, right? So uh, this is a paper that got published uh, in 1951 about long wall versus short, call, short wall coal mining. So they used to do this collaborative pillar team, with, which was short wall, where you went in with your hauler and your picker, and it was on a contract basis. They got paid together. It was ride or die. Uh, the miner had the, the haulers back. A lot of communication and collaboration and a very, very much a sense of team and belonging. Uh, they introduced this long wall, this is a filler, so he's uh, in charge of getting the coal out of the mine. They went and automated this stuff, which means they had to put these long belts in, which turned it into long wall mining. Uh, but what that did is it broke apart the people in the system and plugged them straight into, tech, into the tech. They were dealing with hardware instead of humans, and communication went down. So uh, this is out of that paper, but you can see you had two borers together, uh, two cutters who were cutting the um, coal when they found it, Gummers who were setting up these uh, uh, the braces and all the, all the uh, um, conveyor belts that were, were shipping this stuff out. Breakers who would pull down that work after they were done cutting, um, and the builders would build it back up. And then you had these 20 fillers uh, on their own length, um, and they're not talking to each other, right? Uh, and what ended up happening is these folks, if the fillers weren't getting coal out of the mine, nobody got paid. So this hierarchy formed where these folks had a little bit higher status, uh, were closer together, could talk around behind these people's backs, um, and all, all of it flowed downhill where uh, all these fillers ended up getting blamed if coal wasn't shipping. So uh, sick leave went up, people stopped showing up for work, they had a higher turnover rate, people weren't making as much money because they did not center the humans around that automation when they put the automation in. Um, so being together with technology, security, and worldly maps, um, we want to augment the human needs with tech instead of replacing them. Spend time together, communicate, build trucks, work in diverse teams with mutual goals, and minimize your threat surface. Uh, what else? I had a demo, but uh, the dog, the cyber dog, ate my homework. So uh, we're using SonarCube for a lot of this. I have a couple Docker containers up. 
what the demo was doing is it was pulling up Jenkins uh, in a Docker container. I was building WebGo 8. Um, who's used WebGo before? Number of people. So it's an intentionally, intentionally flawed program to help you learn how to do security better. So uh, there's an OWASP dependency check plugin for Jenkins, uh, which isn't as good as a Sonotype product, but it is free. Uh, which will give you CVE data about uh, third-party jars you're pulling in from Maven Central that might be hot. After that build com completes, we run uh, a Sonar Cube scan, which pulls out OWASP top 10, some CWE stuff, uh, and, and other things like uh, code complexity and uh, duplication. So uh, with respect to mitigating overall risk, uh, removing duplicated code and dropping this, the complexity where your code's more maintainable, more accessible, um, that's narrowing your threat surface, even if that code doesn't have a CV in it explicitly. Even if it's not a vulnerability, I'm still looking at, uh, can I shrink my, my footprint overall? And part of this is the container game. So we've got containers. The idea isn't to grab your whole virtual machine and slam it into a Docker container and put that into production. You want to run the leanest you can. So like Amazon's got Alpine out. Um, it's a really small footprint. Um, Unikernels is more of a theoretical thing. Uh, right now where it's just the code, it's like OCaml code baked straight into the kernel process, so there's not even really an operating system in that container. Uh, but even in the course of doing my demo, uh, the Jenkins latest Docker container I pulled down had a bunch of security vulnerabilities in it. So I had to take that off the shelf component and put it back, and I had to go build an updated container on Alpine uh, with uh, the internal bash from Ubuntu, which is lighter weight, uh, but had to bake Maven into it, so the complexity automatically increased just because the stuff you're pulling out, a Docker hub and off of Maven Central, is probably out of date. Um, if you're keeping maintenance up, it's almost a dedicated role, and a security container talk we heard earlier today alluded to some of that, where it's just a level of rigor and detail of making sure I've got clean images to work with. I understand all this, and I want to help. Um, but maybe that means I need to help security catch up with Docker and Kubernetes and cloud stuff. I want them focused on the security piece, right? So how can we communicate this and collaborate better? Um, and so, yeah, Jenkins build is going to get the dependency check, Sonar Cube for static code analysis. Then we would deploy that to an environment and hit it with Zap, which is an automated pen test. Um, I run a coverage agent on those, so it just tells me what code is getting executed. Again, it's an opportunity to pull dead code out of the system um, and lower our threat surface cumulatively. That if, if I spider your site and we run all our automated testing and I don't see that code, that bytecode executing anywhere in that system, probably safe to delete it. Go ahead and clean it up and get it out. So, uh, I'm right about at time. Uh, start with the map, try this. Uh, there's a book by Elizabeth Show show called uh, Social Practice Mapping. Um, there's a process for popping these out and not directly attacking it. Uh, once you've got this practice established in an org, this cuts down communication. What would be a three hour PowerPoint meeting with a lot of people voting on stuff? You can hand them a map and say, what if we move that over here? And it's like, oh, that would be better if we can make it work. Um, and automate as much as possible so you can respond with agility. Um, if uh, Hart leads a good example, the Struts vulnerability that Equifax got hit with is another one. But if you've got to go through an internal review board and deploy uh, a patch through SSH manually on 10,000 nodes, it's too late, right? Uh, the idea, what you really want to be able to do is if you've got infrastructure as code together, uh, the second the vulnerability comes out, you could be clean in production today, we get a zero day out. Um, if I've got it all automated, I can drop this, I can patch my image or my container, drop those 10,000 nodes and reprovision them in, you know, what? Not even an hour. It shouldn't take an hour to do. Um, and we saw a lot of orgs be able to respond like that, but it's because they, uh, it was fail safe, there was high trust and high communication. It wasn't this rigid, blame driven, process centric behavior we see in a lot of places. Uh, diversity mitigates risk. This gets into Ashby's law of requisite variety. The complexity of your system has to match the complexity of your environment. Um, our environment is getting more complex as it gets more connected. That gets back into the uh, black swan events from fat tail distributions. Uh, but that's with tools, perspectives, and people. Uh, you need multiple roles. 
different kind of people on your team, multiple feedback from uh, different places to be able to, to break an ineffective monoculture. Um, that's all I've got today. Sorry I didn't get into the demo. I will get some code up on GitHub so you all could run that uh, on your own. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. I'm very open to feedback. So you can tell me how DevOps could be doing security better. Uh, let me know. We'll get it back to the community. Thanks, y'all.